solicitation, uh, agent provocateurs infiltrating meetings and groups and uh, to cause right. problems and dissension. Uh, so now, don't you think uh, that if you were living in that time and you were under this kind of uh, scrutiny and organized uh, 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 manipulation and harassment by the most powerful law enforcement agency on the face of the earth, that you would become a little radicalized and maybe start carrying a gun and keep an eye, you know, and watch your back and be around other guys with guns because it would just be so uh, paranoid uh, and, and intense. Well, and and, and rightfully so. Yeah. I, that that and that's what was finally uh, established, and that was why they eventually closed that program because it, it was it just was not just. Uh, uh, Yes, you, you can make an argument for them. You can understand, but unfortunately, it went beyond that. Uh, the the Black Liberation Movement, like I said, they were involved in so many crimes. It was a it was just there was a line between being revolutionary and and believing in something and promoting those beliefs, or crossing over the line and just uh, being a criminal, and that's. That's where they got into trouble. But uh, uh, what about the behavior of the FBI? You don't consider that to be criminal? Yes, and and many and, and many of them were uh, yeah. incarcerated because of it. Yeah, they they, they did uh, go beyond uh, what they should have been doing. Right, and if, did you ever read the book "The Burglary" uh, by Betty Metzger? No, I did not. Oh, you, you, you'd love it. It's fascinating because it's the story of these activists who actually burglar. They knew something was going on. They knew that they were being spied on and if they were being infiltrated. So, And these were white activists. Uh, and, and they burglarized FBI headquarters. And it was a long, they planned it out for a whole year. It's a fascinating. I think there's a couple of documentaries about it too. Fascinating story. We just had to repeat it last week because I had a guest who uh, uh, bailed on me at the last second. So we repeated the show with Betty Metzger. And one of the things they discovered when they stole these FBI files, and this is how we discovered, this is how we found out about the COINTEL program, was that the FBI wasn't just um, uh, uh, surveilling activists, uh, but they had a special uh, focus on the Negroes, on the blacks, right. <laughs> okay, on the right. coloreds. And even they would even say that uh, uh, infiltrate, if you see six or more Negroes gathered together, right. even in churches, that they should right. be infiltrated and spied on. So uh, you could just imagine, it was such a different time uh, back then. Uh, just, uh, I'm 55 years old, so I was born in 62. And uh, just uh, to, to see, you know, the, the murder of Malcolm, Malcolm X and the murder of Martin Luther King and Megar Evers. Right. Uh, it just was such a, a time that uh, you couldn't help but be radicalized. Uh, and, uh, well, for, yeah. you know, that's that, interesting that, 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 because uh, the Quintel Pro program, had something very similar. Uh, this was before they uh, they uh, stopped their organization, but they at one point the FBI and the NYPD yeah in their efforts, and it was called a Joint Terrorism Task Force, and and they and they called it New Kill, and that that was the organization that targeted Assada. But but that it was uh, the whole thing was. Rachel Matter Squad. That was the nickname for it, the Rachel Matter Squad. And and they did. They targeted the, the blacks and the whole pur purpose of it was to uh, to try to control the, the Black Panthers and the Black Liberation Movement and any other organizations that w w were giving uh, black people status in society. Yeah, at one time it was called the Red Squad, the New York City Red Squad also. Uh, and, and even uh, another good book um, I'm, I'm wondering if you've read is uh, by John Potash, uh, The FBI War right. on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders in the U.S. Have you read that book? Right, yes, yes, yeah. I, um, I know that it, it's, a ter it's an interesting period in our history. Yeah. And, and it, but it, and it, you know, in some ways it's changed a great deal, and yet in other ways it hasn't. Uh, uh, right, because if you read John Potash's book, I've had him on the show several times, it, it would appear that the FBI was still surveilling Tupac Shakur and, and leaders of the uh, um, the rap uh, movement. 
you know, and we That's see, right. uh, yeah, we see, uh, what's his name there, uh, uh, Al Sharpton working for the FBI, going around taping people, uh, walking around with his briefcases, making cases against activists and stuff. Uh, so it really, I don't know, has it, has it ended at all? Do you, do you believe that, that this has calmed down at all? Or, or uh, since there's really no left and no uh, resistance whatsoever these days, uh, perhaps the, the, the FBI was successful in putting down any kind of resistance? Uh, it, it, some of it continues even today. Uh, I know uh, Michelle Obama uh, invited a rapper, a black rapper, uh, to the White House to present a program. Hmm. And the, uh, many of the people in Congress just got up in arms about it because the things that he rapped about were uh, against uh, the, the law enforcement and the same things that they were fighting for back when Assata was uh, so uh, vocal, right? Uh, thing, and because of that, uh, she eventually just withdrew the invitation. Uh, hmm. But so it still goes on today to a certain extent. So now you were saying that uh, Asada again before she was ever convicted of any crimes that she was under uh, increased surveillance in New York. Uh, what did you what did you call it again? The racial you called it? What was it called? The, uh, that was the racial matters. Racial group. matters. Racial matters. Uh huh. But uh, the, they they were looking at her and for her because uh, so many people were coming forward and saying that she was involved in the in the killing. The witnesses, eyewitnesses, were coming forward saying that she was one that was involved in the killing here or or a bank robbery there, and uh, it just seemed like everything that happened, she was involved in it. And that was one reason why they were trying to find her, so they could question her. Uh, she started, uh, when she started seeing her friends get killed, as you were talking about, and uh, many of them went underground, uh, that was when she went underground. Uh, and she uh, successfully avoided uh, being arrested or even interrogated until that uh, incident on the turnpike in New Jersey. So, okay, is that what you want to get into now, the, the incident on the turnpike in New Jersey? Well, um, uh, that's, that's probably a good place to, to go to right now because, okay. uh, you know, we've, uh, we know what she was like as a little girl and then how that grew into her, her education with the uh, community college in New York and then on into Berkeley and uh, her organization uh, uh, memberships and that. And so, all of it, all of this was building right. all of her this focus that she had, uh, armed resistance, whatever it takes to build up the black uh, community, is building. And so, it was on this particular evening in, in uh, uh, 1973, uh, she and. Two other, a former mem Black Panther member and uh, a member of the Black Panther group were driving on the New Jersey Turnpike. And uh, a New Jersey patrolman uh, noticed that one of their taillights wasn't working properly. And he drove up beside them and uh, noticed that there were two black males and a black female. And he radioed it in and said that he was going to pull them at the at the next uh, uh, stop, and uh, he wanted backup. And one of the other patrolmen responded saying he he was on his way. And when he did pull over the car, he asked the driver to uh, get out, and he wanted see his identification, and he, he found something that, that didn't look right. Uh, let me stop yeah. you there for a second. And, and I hate, I hope I don't throw you off too much when I ask you these questions, because... Uh, oh, no. Okay, good. Because <laughs> okay, I, I worry sometimes, you know, because I got my own thought pattern. But what was the reasonable cause? What was the, the probable cause to pull him over? His, his radio message, when he called it in, said it was because there was... There was uh, uh, a tail light that was wasn't functioning properly during the trial 
uh, his superior officer said they were also speeding slightly, which was another reason why they got pulled. Right. right. Although that wasn't uh, said uh, when he when he initially called it in. And 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 I think too for for the young people who listen to the show today, you know, actually young people, you know, <laughs> I'm 55. But back in the 70s, when you got pulled over, like when my dad got pulled over. Uh, the the way you did it back then was if you got out of your car and ran over to the police car as quick as you could, he, if the cop didn't have to get out of the car, maybe you didn't get a ticket. <laughs> okay, now it's totally different. Now you have to sit in your car, you can't move, you have to keep your hands on the steering wheel, otherwise it's a whole big deal. And they don't, you know, you're not supposed to leave the car. My God forbid, never. Uh, but back in in those days, they told you if you want to get out of a ticket. Especially if it's raining out there, don't let the cop get out of his car. Meet him back there and start talking your way out. And you could talk your way out of a ticket back in the 70s and the 80s. You could talk your way out of a ticket. Now forget it. You can't. (laughs) No, times have changed. It's it's, it's just too dangerous. There's there's just too many things going on in society. And uh, in this case, he did ask. uh, 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 It was uh, Sundiati Okali, Okali, who was driving. Mm. And he asked him to get out, and he, he was one that uh, showed him his license, but there was some in- discrepancy that uh, that uh, kind of alerted uh, this trooper. And in the meantime, uh, there was another, a third trooper that drove up, and that was Trooper Forrester. And uh, uh, uh that point, the gunfight started, and uh, everything happens quickly in a gunfight. And when it was all said and done, Trooper Forrester was dead. Trooper Harper had been shot. Uh, Asada had been shot, but she managed to get back in the car and then uh, and, and escape with a collie. And but they, the troopers. Uh, the trooper who survived uh, called it in, and and they were just not that. They were only about a mile from the highway patrol office, and so then all the other troopers went after them, and they eventually caught up with them. And uh, uh, there's so many variations of the story. You have Asada's story, and you have the troopers' version, and and the uh, there was a uh, an eyewitness who happened to be driving by at the time. And, that you know, the stories vary. It just depends on who's telling it. Asada says that uh, she was shot three times, which she was. She was shot twice in her arms and and then in the back. And uh, uh, she said that when the trooper got there, he pulled her out of the car and stomped on her. Uh, but that was her second story. Her first story was that um, Okali carried her t- out of the car trying to conceal her in a ditch. And uh, uh, so, you know, you don't know. Mm. Uh, uh, the, what remains is that there were two deaths from it. It was uh, the third passenger in Asada's car and then Trooper Forrester. Uh, now, now, besides uh, the, the passenger who was found later on in the gully, right? Uh, what, are you, right. what did you come up with on that? Because uh, in some, it, it wasn't even talked about in, in the initial uh, phone uh, uh, police reports. Not the police reports, but, but the police uh, dispatches and radio calls that there was a third person who was shot. He was found shot like hours later, right? Well, now that was Trooper Forrester. Okay. They apparently had not call, uh, notified uh, the home office that he was also uh going to back up Harper and so they that the the highway dispatch didn't even know that he was on the scene mm. and it was only later after they went back to the the original crime scene where the shooting had occurred that they found trooper Forrester and he was already dead he had been shot four times uh twice in the head uh, at point blank range execution style with his own gun mm. and then two other times um, his his gun was found in the in the car that fled with Asada and a collie. So uh, it must have been a horrible, horrible uh, situation. I mean, there was a lot of gunfire. There there were a lot of uh, 
wounds and uh, Asada wound up going to the hospital and she wouldn't 